Good evening and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. On this month's edition of Other Voices, we're going to talk about something called Trans-Pacific Partnership, a massive economic agreement being negotiated among 12 Pacific Rim countries. Some are calling it a trade agreement, but it's much more than a trade agreement. At the Peace and Justice Center, we've been referring to it as a Bill of Rights for Corporations. Others call it NAFTA on steroids. We're going to take a deep look at TPP on this month's edition of Other Voices. And to help us do that, I am very pleased to welcome Robert Longer. He is the Legislative Political Director of the Communications, Communication Workers of America, Local 9421, based in Sacramento. Robert, welcome. Thank you. And thanks for coming down from Sacramento no problem. tonight. Um, just briefly, tell us what a Legislative Political Director does for Communication Workers of America. Well, we oversee advocacy and legislation and policies on behalf of uh, workers, not just in the communications industry, but in many other industries throughout the Sacramento region and indeed throughout the country. Uh, my job is to work with our legislative advocates at the state capitol to oversee policies and legislation uh, that's going through the legislature in both the Senate and the Assembly, and to make sure that we work in close uh, concert with other organizations uh, and to build broader organizations such as our fight against the TPP and Fast Track. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about those broad organizations later on. When I was trying to find a guest for this program, I asked our local Central Labor Council for a recommendation. They recommended you and said, you have been living and breathing <laughs> TPP for the last two years. I, yes, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but part of that was the Fast Track fight, yeah. which that's over. Um, where is TPP right now? We did a program on it about a year ago, and it was still being negotiated. And I think a lot of people think when what was called the final round in mm -hmm. Hawaii back at the end of July, mm -hmm. when that failed, a lot of people, I think, think uh, went away, that it, it wasn't an issue anymore. That's not true, is it? That's not true. You're right. Uh, in fact, uh, the TPP fight is still ongoing. Uh, we still have a broad-based coalition uh, that is looking to oppose TPP. Um, our main focus beforehand had been focused on Fast Track, uh, which is Trade Promotion Authority. It's, a, it's basically a mechanism to take away Congress's constitutional authority yeah. and give that to the administration and let the president's trade advisor run with that, negotiate trade deals on his behalf, and then send back the negotiated trade pact to Congress and at that point, they would have no ability to modify or change or amend it. They could only vote up or down. So it basically takes away all of our uh, uh, insight, our oversight over the process vis-a-vis -vis Congress. Uh, it takes away their constitutional authority. It takes away that third branch of government. Uh, that's a dangerous thing, as we all know. It started back in the Nixon administration. Uh -huh. So it's a very old uh, piece of uh, you-know-what that yeah. they, they used to. <laughs> Uh, take away uh, our ability to oversee these and have the due diligence, the, the discourse, the debates, uh, and the things that we should be entitled to as citizens in this country. And that brings up the question that that kind of congressional oversight normally should, on something like this, mm -hmm. uh, as massive an agreement as this, right. really should have started some, some time ago, you know, yeah. to have yeah. Congress weighing in. Right. But in fact, when they were going for the fast track vote, that was the first time anybody in Congress even got to see any of the text of the bill. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And in, in fact, uh, we met face to face with our members of Congress, as did our colleagues across the country, and we urged them to take a look at this trade agreement. At first, uh, several years ago, they did not have access at all. And keep in mind, these are elected officials. These are members of Congress, U.S. senators. Uh, in the case of Diane Feinstein, Barbara Boxer, representing 20 million Californians each 
40 million people, and they did not have access to these texts. They were deemed classified, highly top secret documents, yet 600 corporate advisors, corporate attorneys from all the large Fortune 500 companies were at the table with the United States trade rep, Michael Froman, uh, negotiating this trade deal behind closed doors, and yet our elected officials, who we elect through the democratic process, did not have access to that. That slightly changed recently when the US, US trade rep allowed access, but it was uh, under the, the strictest of provisions. Uh, uh -huh. Basically, they were taken to uh, a little room in the basement of Congress, if, if you will. An undisclosed uh, an location. An undisclosed location. <laughs> uh, and in fact, they were not allowed any aides or staffers to be involved. They could not take any notes. They could not write anything down or take anything out of the room with them. And the text that they saw was heavily redacted. Uh, lots of the, the, the elements were, were crossed out. And we know this from a couple of reasons. One, because some of the information has been leaked right. from sources like WikiLeaks. And we've had uh, members of Congress that have actually gone into that room and told us this is what they've seen. Um, and that's a concern. When, when these are the folks that are supposed to have oversight, um, can't even see what's going to be uh, put in there. Yeah, when we did the program about a year ago, all we had to go on was the material that came out through WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, now at least we have, because of some congressional right. reps, a, a little better idea of, of what's in there. Yeah. Um, so let's let's dig in. Sure. Um, do we know how long it is? I think NAFTA was like twenty-five thousand pages or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, what we've been told is it's it's a couple thousand pages, much like the Affordable Care Act. But in those uh, couple thousand pages, of course, the devil's in the details, right? So it's being pitched as a trade deal when, in fact, it's not really about trade uh, as much as it is about everything else under the sun. There are some tariff things in there, mm -hmm. which are the usual sure. realm of, of trade agreements right. to, to lift tariffs and make it cheaper. Right. What we know is there's 29 chapters in this, uh, what uh -huh. they call chapters. Of those, about five are traditional trade, as you said, uh, tariffs, the movement of physical goods over physical borders, uh, the things that we would think about when we think about trade deals. But this covers so five much out more. Of 29, five out of twenty-nine. Five out of twenty-nine. One sixth. Exactly. Thing. Exactly. So that begs the question: Well, what's in the other twenty-four chapters, <laughs> right? And what we've seen is I the, can't wait to get to the end. Yeah, of this book. We, right. <laughs> what we've seen is that, gosh, it covers nearly everything that we could be passionate about or concerned about, from the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, uh, folks in the environment, the environmental community that we partner with. Many different organizations, probably the most well-known is the Sierra Club, uh, were at our side in this broad coalition to fight this. Of course, their concerns, uh, which are all, all of our concerns, are about uh, our environment, right? And um, that also includes the, the food and the, the water that we drink. So fracking is a big, it's a big deal, right? Here, well, here in California, yeah, especially. Yeah. Well, let, how does, uh, let, let's just start there with right. the, the environmental issues. Right. How does uh, TPP impact those? Sure. So there, there's language in there that talks about, because this is a Pacific Rim trade agreement, uh, it covers literally the entirety of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, 12 uh, which nations. Is, yeah. Right, 12 nations, uh, starting with the three NAFTA countries, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. goes down into South America, Peru, Chile, over into the South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, Brunei, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Japan. Uh, and so all of these countries together... But not the economic powerhouse China. Oh, yeah, right. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet? Not yet. They um, want in? But, yeah, in fact, that, that's, that's being debated right now. Uh, this agreement is called the docking agreement, which means that any country can dock or latch on to this agreement if they simply agree to the terms in the future. Uh -huh. So a country like Japan, uh, excuse me, China, could, in fact, come on to this agreement at some point in the future if it's ever passed through Congress. Um, but on the environment itself, of course, the Pacific Ocean is our breadbasket when it comes to our fisheries, right? right. Uh, all of our tuna and everything we, that we get out of, the, out of the ocean. And, of course, it's being uh, heavily polluted, as we all well know. Yeah. There's a huge garbage patch in the Pacific between here and Hawaii. Um, and so, so there's concerns about, you know, the food that we're getting out of the ocean, particularly Vietnam as a, as a case in point. Uh, we get most of our shrimp from Vietnam. Um, and this is uh, toxic shrimp, is what we're calling it, because huh. it's literally cesspools where they're growing this shrimp. And then it's all farmed there. It's all farmed there yeah. and shipped over here to the U.S. And we're consuming this stuff without 
knowing where it's coming from, number one. I'm a big Trump fan too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and of course, that's a problem, right? So, so that, that's a big issue. Another issue, of course, as I mentioned, is fracking. Um, we've seen hydraulic fracturing uh, take place throughout the country, but particularly here in California. Um, and we have, of course, we're the breadbasket when it comes to food and for the rest of the country for the most part. And so when these farmers are out there and we have these industries coming in and they have uh, water rights and the ability to go in and drill, uh, they inject these toxic chemicals into the ground and inject that with water and break up the shale. Yeah. And what that does, as we all well know through many documented cases, is it, is it uh, pollutes our water supply. Um, and this pollutes the aquifers, it uh, pollutes wells. Uh, that's a big concern. Well, how does TPP interact with, with the fracking? We've already got fracking right. going on. Does right. it open it up to more people, yeah. or more nations? Uh, it, it could. It, it could. It reduces fact, challenges to fracking. Though. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a process uh, that's not new. In fact, it dates back to the NAFTA days, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, and basically, it's called the Investor State Dispute Settlement, or ISDS. What this does is it allows corporations to sue sovereign nations, such as the United States, for expected future profit loss, if you can wrap your head around that, right? So basically, what they're saying is, hey, you're impeding my ability as a fat cat corporation to make uh -huh. a ton of money, and I project I'm going to make billions of dollars in the future if only I can frack in California, for example. So let's say the city of Palo Alto passes a no fracking ordinance at some point in the future, if they don't already have one, um, and says, they you know what? We barely just got them to raise the minimum wage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, and, and everybody says, great, that's wonderful. No fracking in Palo Alto. That's, that's a good thing, right? Well, guess what? That can be challenged under the ISDS process. In effect, it's a tribunal system. Um, it's separate from our court system, so it's separate from the local, the municipal, the state, and the federal court system. And it takes this process. And I take it this is true in all 12 countries. All 12 countries. So every member country that signs on to the TPP is in agreement with this by way of their uh, inclusion. And so this ISDS tribunal, it's basically three uh, corporate attorneys that will decide if Palo Alto's, uh, in, this, in this example, Palo Alto's uh, ordinance is in fact impeding on a corporation like Chevron uh, to frack in Palo Alto. And if they determine and rule that in fact, yeah, it's, it's affecting their profits, then they will instruct and rule and order the city of Palo Alto to strike that law from the books and allow these corporations to come in and, and start fracking. Or pay up for, or the, pay up for, it. Exactly. for the lost profits, whatever right. they say that's going to be. Right, it's legalized extortion is yeah. what it is. So the obvious question is, where do these uh, corporate attorneys come from? Who appoints them? Right, good question. Well, who the same approves folks, of them? <laughs> yeah, the same folks who are negotiating this trade deal with the United States trade rep, all the Fortune uh, 500 companies and, and, and then some, about 600 corporate advisors, that's essentially the pool that the U.S. Trade Rep's office, through the administration, will then select who will uh, chair and, and be a part of this ISDS panel and process. And does the panel change with each issue and they, they pick it could, yes, tribunal members yes. who are so-called experts? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you could have an attorney from Chevron deciding on a case for Because for he Shell, has the expertise. As an example. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Because they're... In, energy expert. And of course, as we all know, that, that is just a, just a rigged process from the beginning. Uh, there's, there's no clear light uh, that's, that's shed on this process. It's, it's done in secret. And it's outside and apart from our democratic process, our court system. So in other words, you know, we couldn't, the city of Palo Alto in that example couldn't then sue or try to get an injunction to stop that from happening. Once the decision is made, you either have to pay up or they'd have to allow them to go ahead and frack. You said that um, this has been in a lot of mm -hmm. these so-called trade agreements right. going back to NAFTA. Um, right. Have there been some lawsuits like this? Yeah, in fact, there's, there's $14 billion in pending ISDS claims from trade deals all the way from NAFTA to CAFTA, uh, recent trade deals uh, like the, the Korea Free Trade Agreement. Um, and what, what these cases are is just uh, these corporations saying, hey, I don't like a law that you pass. A good uh, case in point is Australia. 
uh, Australia passed a plain cigarette packaging law. Basically said, hey, you know, you can't have pretty pictures on your packages of cigarettes that, that lure kids and get folks to buy cigarettes. Um, and so it was a pretty simple law. They passed it. Uh, it's a national law. That was then challenged by Philip Morris. Philip Morris said, hey, time out. You're, you're going to cost us billions of dollars in profits in Australia. Uh, and so they sued under the ISDS process. Uh, they're still going through that process, but uh, we expect that they will prevail. Um, and then the country of Australia will then have to capitulate to this private panel uh, and allow Philip Morris and, and others to go ahead and do whatever they want to do when it comes to selling this, this toxic product. Um, that's just one case study. Recently here in the U.S., uh, our um, meat uh, has been a subject of, of discussion. Um, so there's, there's a law in the books uh, that uh, talks about country of origin labeling mm -hmm. or COOL uh, that allows us to know where our food comes from. So if we get food from, uh, from Canada or Mexico, beef from Canada, for example, it will say Canadian beef. Pretty simple, right? We know the products that we're eating. Um, this was challenged under the World Trade Organization. Uh, the, the World Trade Organization ruled against the United States and in favor of Canada and Mexico under provisions of NAFTA uh, and, and, and other terms. And essentially said, no, you cannot have labeling on your packages. So you don't know where your meat is coming from. Do they have to explain themselves or just say that they don't like it? I mean, what's their gripe with that? You know, that's a good question. It's kind of like your, your parents, right? When they just told you, it, you know, they just said, just do it. And, yeah. and, and they didn't give you a reason why. That's basically what's happening here. That uh, made sense with my parents. But <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and so what we have is, is these, these terms uh, being dictated, kind of like the mafia, I'd, I'd, I'd say. Uh, that's just, you know, you do it or else. And um, we have to capitulate and go, go about it. And in, in essence, uh, it forces Congress to then, you know, start the, the process to repeal these, these laws um, or else. Uh, or else it opens the United States up as a sovereign nation. I think that's, the, that's, the, that's one of the more troubling points in, in these so-called trade agreements like the TPP, is it opens up a sovereign nation, a country, to be challenged by a private corporation yeah. outside of our court system. Yeah, it's, it's a reversal of what seems to make sense mm -hmm. and, um, of our own systems, our own democratic systems right. and open systems. Right. Oh, so uh, investor state dispute settlement. That's ISDS, a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah this, when you, I know when you get into these trade agreements, right. it's it's all acronyms all day, uh, but that's really one of the the meatier aspects of why people are opposed to this. It's it's such a powerful corporate friendly system. Mm -hmm. it, it, in fact, ISDS is why we've taken to calling it a bill of rights for corporations. Exactly. Because that's that's. They are the only beneficiaries of this. There's, there is no way that the residents of any one of these 12 countries are going to find any uh, benefit in that aspect of this trade agreement. Yeah, and, and that's why we through. see this, this full-fledged coalition, very, very broad-based. In fact, here in the U.S., we have over 2,000 organizations that are opposed to the fast-track process, and now that that's passed through Congress very narrowly in June, uh, to the TPP itself. Uh, but it's not just the TPP. I mean, certainly this is the largest trade agreement in history, by far. 40% of the global economy, yeah. almost a billion people, almost $30 trillion in gross domestic product. It's not just that. There's also the TISA, the Trade and Services Agreement, uh, with many more countries. It talks about investments. Uh, there's the TTIP agreement with the United uh, European Union as well. Um, so there's these, all these other trade deals that are pending and ones that we don't even know about that are on the horizon. Uh -huh. uh, this fast track authorization that was recently passed in Congress in June by a very slim margin, uh, just a couple of votes in the House and the, in the Senate, um, allows for an authorization of three to six years for the current president, but also, more importantly, the next president uh -huh. and potentially a third president if they're, they're a one-term president to then move these trade deals through Congress without any oversight, as, as we talked about earlier, and Congress will just have an up or down vote. Yeah. How is it 
three to six years authorization. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the language is a little bit tricky, but basically it allows Congress to reauthorize Fast Track uh, for a, a number of more of years. So essentially, there are provisions technically to revoke it. Uh, that's very unlikely to happen for a couple of reasons. Uh, we all know how the composition of Congress is right now with Republican control. That probably won't change until at least 2020 when we do the next census and redistrict. Um, so it's unlikely that this is going to change. Yeah. Um, and so realistically, we're looking at probably six years of authorization, carte blanche, yeah. for this president and the next to essentially ramrod through any trade deal uh, through Congress, and it takes away their ability to do their job. To be fair, I think every president since Nixon has had fast track this authorization. This is true. This though. is true. This is true. It's and I something think something Washington likes for whatever reason. Yeah. Well, the, the 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 pitch to all of us is that you know what, it's going to make our lives easier, right? It you know don't worry about this Congress. You don't need to do your job in this case. We'll just negotiate the trade deal without your input, uh, without your oversight, and then we'll send it back to you. And guess what? You get to vote on it, but you can't change it. You can't debate it. Well, yeah. there's, there's limited debate, but essentially it takes them out of the process. And the idea is, hey, this is a good thing, right? It helps to speed up our access to these markets. It helps us in the case of the, of the TPP, it's being pitched as securing the region for the U.S., stability in the region uh, with these countries like China. Uh, China has been used as a, as a red herring in this case, right? Big, scary China. We need to protect ourselves from, from China yeah. uh, and incorporate countries like Vietnam and Malaysia and Japan in the region, which would then, in theory, be able to compete with China and push down some of their influence in the region. Yeah. Communist China, whose stock market is crashing. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Let's yeah. talk about some more of what's in sure. TPP. Sure. Um, there's, uh, you mentioned... Uh, um, GMO labeling? No, uh, the uh, country of origin labeling. Right, country of origin, This yes. impacts uh, possible GMO labeling. It does, it does. In fact, basically what you have is, is again, you have these corporate uh, advocates, these lobbyists, these lawyers that are at the table. So it's no secret they're going to advocate for their respective business and their organization, right? So if you have a, a company like Monsanto, who is obviously uh, heavily invested in seeds, and invested in genetically modified organisms, their business model is going to say, guess what? We don't need any GMO lab labeling. Uh, we don't want to tell the public what they're eating if, it, if it's made out of GMO products. Um, that's in their best interest to, to exclude that from the market. Um, and so it's no surprise when these types of things are pushed at the table. Granted, we haven't seen all this language but because, again, it's, it's classified. Right. It's technically classified. So, We've had some of the leaked uh, information from sources like WikiLeaks. We talked about the ISDS. Uh, another a provision that was leaked is, is pharmaceuticals and okay. patents. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, well, right now is in the market, a pharmaceutical company, they come up with a new medication. It's a wonderful drug, and, and we're all happy about it. And, and guess what? They've got a patent protection on that. And they can take that patent for as much as 20 years. Wow. Uh, in essence, that that... Uh, that brand that they've patented is theirs. They own it. There's no generic versions that can be made of it for that period of time that it's protected. Of course, other countries and other areas, they can do that, and that has no bearing on the U.S. market, and they do. Uh, but here in the U.S., uh, those companies can't compete, and therefore the prices stay high. Cost of a pill for uh, AIDS medication or whatnot is very, very high. Then when that patent expires, all the formularies uh, can go in and, and reformulate the product, introduce a generic version, and the price, of course, drops down. It's the same medication, same medicine. Yeah. right? Uh, it's the same chemistry, <laughs> and so it's great because the public now has access to a cheaper, affordable product that will save lives in, in some cases. And uh, what they are talking about in this leaked text is then to extend that pat patent protection in essence, they would just tweak the formulation of the medication a little bit. They'd reapply for a patent and presumably would get that with no problem. And then would be able to repatent that or re-extend their protection for up to another 20 years. So the current thing is 
20 years, mm -hmm. and then a generic can be made by just tweaking the formula a little bit, change right. one molecule right. or something. Right. And then it, it's open. Right. Uh, but now the original patent owner mm -hmm. can do the tweak mm -hmm. and call it a new drug. Right. And sell it at, at the high prices yeah. for and another 20 years? Uh, up to another 20 years, cer certainly. Of course, this is all subject to change, but this is what we've seen through some right. of the leaked text. So you can have a company like Pfizer or any, any of those types of companies, and they can go in there and essentially rule and control the marketplace when it comes to certain yeah. medications. And can they do that ad infinitum? Uh, uh, after 40 years, uh, they, you they know, tweak uh, another molecule? And depending got on another how the final language uh, yeah. you know, comes about, it, it, that is certainly a possibility. Of course, that, that, that begs the question, how do we get these medicines? How do we uh, get these out into the to the marketplace for the average person, uh, and not just here in the U.S. Uh, certainly, we have problems with our healthcare system and the delivery model, but in other countries, especially on the African continent and in, uh, in other areas where it is literally a life or death situation yeah. in some of these cases. And so, there's an ethical and there's a moral uh, question that we have there. Uh, is it right? For a private corporation to essentially hold uh, someone's life in their hands uh, by controlling these medications, and, and you know, I, I'm sure I can answer that question and say it's not right. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us uh, would agree on that subject, but their 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 ultimate goal, of course, as always, is to to make a profit, and profit is king, and capital is king, and and they don't care about lives. They don't care about the food that we eat. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a major concern, and so it's being pitched vis-a-vis -vis these supposed trade deals. Again, it's, it's little about trade and a lot to do about pretty much everything else. Um, another, another area that I thought was interesting is uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, so these would be things like the United States Postal Service or Canada Post, for example. Um, they exist not to make a profit. Uh, they deliver our mail. Um, we rely on them as a public service, right? It's a state-owned enterprise. They don't get any taxpayer funding. Uh, they're self-funded. We buy postage stamps. We pay for the postman to deliver our mail. That can be challenged and, in fact, is being challenged uh, in the TPP. The post office? Right. And, and why is that? Because they don't make a profit. And so you have companies like uh, UPS and yeah. FedEx. I was say, just going to ask, are FedEx and UPS <laughs> at the table negotiating? Certainly, and, and yeah. their counterparts in Canada and, and all these other countries, they, they want to make a profit. They, they want to be able to uh, monetize that system. Um, and so that's another example of a, a state-owned enterprise, a public service that we rely on uh, that can be challenged through the TPP. Yeah. The original idea came from Ben Franklin. That's how American <laughs> it is. <laughs> right. What else do we know? Well, there's uh, also um, uh, other things that, that involve uh, financial regulations and investments. Uh -huh. um, so that's a little bit more covered in this other trade deal called TISA, Trade and Services Agreement. But essentially, there's a lot of protections for Wall Street banks. Uh, we certainly saw oh, that after the, the financial collapse, uh, a rush to try to shore up some of our, our uh, flawed regulations. In fact, we had little regulation, as we well know, uh, which is why the bottom fell out. And we had all this speculative investment uh, yeah. uh, by these hedge fund managers. Um, all sounds uh, esoteric until it actually impacts people, and they lose their homes. They lose their jobs. Their life savings. Their life their savings, right? 401k. We all, I think we all know a friend, a family member, somebody that's lost their job, somebody that's been impacted um, in this area. Um, as a labor person coming from a labor union, we're particularly concerned because we've seen past trade deals like NAFTA ship jobs out of this country. Um, and here in California, it, just to, as an example, uh, we lost almost 650,000 jobs due to NAFTA and the inclusion of China and the World Trade Organization. Wow. Here in Northern California, that's uh, almost 300,000 jobs that we lost just from that one trade deal. These are quantifiable, real numbers. We can directly attribute these to, to a trade deal. And that was one trade deal with three countries, the United States and Canada and Mexico. The TPP, 12 countries. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it could also grow bigger. It's a docking agreement, as we talked about. Yeah. 
So potentially you have half of the world's economy in one trade deal that has no end. I think that, that we should repeat that. These trade deals have no sunset language. They do not go away. NAFTA is still in effect and will remain in effect. TPP will do the same. There, there, is, there is no end to these. Is there an opt-out? Uh, good question, yes. Technically, a country could, could uh, remove itself from a trade agreement uh, and say that they didn't agree with provisions and want to, to be able to get out. Um, has that happened? It hasn't happened. Never happened. Right, yeah. right. I, so this financial services thing, does that, um, is Congress going to get sued for the uh, <laughs> Uh, Dodd Frank uh, regulation bill. You know, I, I'm laughing, but it 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 is, is all possible. Kind of it's it's the... all possible under a trade deal. There, there's a lot of things that we don't know. Yeah. What we do know is is the past, right? We know what's happened throughout throughout history. Um, you know, we were made grand promises under NAFTA, and then again recently uh, with Chorus, the Korea Free Trade Agreement. We were promised uh, 70,000 jobs that would be create, created. This is a trade agreement recent, back in 2011 timeframe, under the Obama administration, Democratic president. We thought, this is great, one country. We're going to boost our auto industry. We're going to start uh, shipping American cars over to Korea. What did we see happen in just a couple years? We saw the reverse happen. We, we lost 70,000 jobs. We were promised 70,000. We lost 70,000, and those are quantifiable hard numbers. So that's a net loss of 140,000. <laughs> yeah, 70 that we didn't yeah. get and 70 that we lost. Right, right. And, and our auto industry didn't benefit from that. We didn't start you know, opening up manufacturing centers in Korea. They're, we're still getting Kias shipped over here from, uh -huh. from Korea, right, which is, which, is, which is fine if you're a Korean. Uh, but for American manufacturing, that, that's a problem. Yeah. All right, let's get our uh, audience in on this because it is other voices and we want everybody's voices in here. If you have a question or a comment or you need clarification on something, just hold your hand up and uh, Crystal will bring a microphone to you. And please wait till the microphone gets to you or people watching at home will not be able to hear what you have to say. I don't see hands flying up, so we may be stuck <laughs> with this. Okay. okay. There we go. Um, and please stand up, if you will, and make it easier on our camera people. Hi. Uh, Hello. Thanks for being here. Um, I kind of refer to the TPP as not a trade agreement between countries, mm -hmm. but a trade agreement between countries and global corporations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that is probably the truth, but it doesn't get much it doesn't have much weight. And I'm wondering if the opposition to the trade agreements mm -hmm. do focus groups to find out what is the best message like corporations do to, pro you know, to promote their products. They right. focus, test their message. And like I'm thinking right now, what do I tell young uh, a, a family, uh, people with young children, mm -hmm. families, mm -hmm. How can I explain the danger of the TPP to someone with young children? Right. Good question. Good question. Yeah, Great question. Some, some um, examples of right. This. First of all, I, I I totally agree with you with regard to this being a, a corporate document. Uh, this is not about the United States as a sovereign country advancing our country's interests in the global marketplace, and it's not even about trade as we talked about. Um, so how do we talk to people? Well, we've formed a coalition. This is a coalition that goes back several years. And this is a broad-based coalition. So we wanted to make sure that this was not a labor coalition. This is not a union thing. This is not even a jobs thing, although certainly that's, that's, that's core to a lot of this. Um, this is about the faith community. This is about the environmental community, veterans, uh, social justice movement. Uh, we, we, we've, rights, been, we've, been, we've been surprised. I mean. We've got a graphic back here, uh, protests from around the world. Um, we've been surprised at res the response, uh, but I don't think that we should be surprised because what we've seen is this assemblage of such a broad-based group of folks that it really speaks to how far this gets into all of our lives. Uh, in other words, this, we can all connect the dots at some point when our friend or our spouse or somebody has lost their job or has been told, that, you know what, um, we need to compete with, with China and we need to compete with these other corporations, or excuse me, uh, countries, 
And uh, because of that, we need to not give you a raise. Or you know what, we're going to close your, your center and we're going to move that to another country. It, oh, and it's not your fault. It's just that they can do it cheaper. Um, and so we're fighting this model. And, and how can we compete? A uh, good, good uh, country to mention in this particular trade agreement is Vietnam. Vietnam is a country that, on average, they're, they're paid about 50 cents an hour American. It's in, illegal in their constitution to form a union, so they can't even raise their standard uh, of living. Um, and they have uh, child labor and slave labor. These are documented cases. They're recognized by the United States. Um, so how can we compete against that, right? Um, and I think what we need to do in terms of talking to our friends, our neighbors, uh, about this is we can never compete with these countries and we can never compete with their standard of living if all we're doing is going down. It's a global race to the bottom. That's how we compete is right, to go right, down. Right, and, 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 and you know what, if we believe that model, if we believe that we should come down to their standard of living, then okay, I don't. Uh, and, and our coalition doesn't. And so it's like JFK said, right, all bo boats rise with the tide. We need to bring them up to, to our level. Now, let's be real. I mean, I, idealistically, that's, it's not feasible to think in a couple years or through one trade agreement that we can do that. But we know what past trade agreements have done, and we know that this is what we, why we call it NAFTA on steroids, yeah. as we talked about earlier. And so we can use this as a model, as a rally cry, to, to take this down while we still have a chance, while we have this broad-based support, and keep having those conversations and tell people that it is doable. We derailed the expansion of the World Trade, Trade Organization the, uh, in Seattle, the big movement in 99. A uh, huge movement, right? The people got out, they protested in the streets, we got coverage in the media, um, we were able to, to derail that expansion. It, WTO is bad enough, but it could have been worse. So we have that power, we have that ability, but we've got to have those conversations. I was wondering, I, before we'll get back to the audience, um, the question was specifically about what do you say to somebody with, with kids? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the thought struck me, well, your example of the post office mm -hmm. and wanting forces wanting to privatize the post office. Mm -hmm. Education is a public yeah, institution yeah. as well. Definitely. It, great, it, great point. I mean, anything that we think of as a public service under that model is at risk. Um, and so if you're, uh, if you're a fan of charter schools or for-profit schools, a voucher system, then you, you'll love the TPP because they would love to get rid of our public education system. And that's not just K through 12. That's all of our public university system, our community college system as well. Um, so I think what I would tell you know, parents with kids is that do you want your child to have a good education, number one? And once they get that good education or some sort of education and go out into the marketplace to try to make a living to take care of themselves so that they can raise their kids, what job or jobs are they going to have access be, you know, have access to a service sector job serving burgers at McDonald's is is this the future that we want for our kids or fried shrimp from Vietnam right exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly okay let's uh, let's go back to the audience where uh, Crystal try the back row there if you'd stand up please. hi <clears throat> hello how strong is the opposition to the TPP among the twelve Asian states that are involved in the negotiations? And is there any coalition spanning both sides of the Pacific in an attempt to coordinate opposition to the TPP? Thank you. Thank you. Question. Excellent question. Great yeah. question. The good news is that we've seen massive response from our global partners in this. So, um, you know, with my partners, we our union actually represents flight attendants all throughout the Pacific Rim, United Airlines, Hawaiian Airlines, etc. And so we have bases and members across the Pacific Rim footprint. And so we certainly work with them and they work with their counterparts over there. The good news is that there is strong opposition. I mentioned 2,000 organizations here in the US. Similar opposition and coalitions have been built in Australia, in Japan, in all of these member countries. You know, there, there's some things that really get us concerned. I mentioned Vietnam. Brunei is a small nation state uh, that's included in this trade deal. The Sultan of Brunei is, is notorious for killing people. Um, in the case of LGBT rights, uh, an LGBT person can be literally stoned to death 
just for being who they are in Brunei. That's their law. Mm. This is a country that we are including in this trade deal. And so, of course, very low-key in Brunei, we have activists that have come out to you know, oppose the TPP, although they might not me directly mention the LGBT provision, they certainly understand directly because they can literally see when somebody is killed under this, that it's, this is real world stuff. Um, Malaysia recently in the news uh, for mass graves that were uncovered um, of workers that were literally killed uh, after they were used because they uh, didn't need them anymore. Um, this is a country that is a known violator of human trafficking. And so um, the United States recently upgraded Malaysia from yeah, a tier, I, I'm glad you tier brought three that up. That to was a tier shameful. two country. Yeah. Totally shameful. And why did they do that? Because there was a provision called the Menendez provision in the TPP that said we cannot. It, in the fast track. In the fast passed. track, excuse me, the fast track that, that said we cannot do business with a country like this. Guess what? The United States just changed their, their status, the, the State upgraded Department. them, uh, right, the State Department, and now it's no longer a problem. That so was you have just folks, two or three weeks ago that right, they did just that. Just recently, and so you have folks in Malaysia, you have folks in Brunei, and all of these member countries that know those specific examples and all the things that matter to them, the folks in Australia uh, with Philip Morris, as I mentioned earlier, all of these things that we can get behind, whatever we're passionate about, whether it's labor, the environment, et cetera, we have strong coalitions. That's the good news in all of this. And they're continuing that fight today. Um, I want to follow up on uh, the audience member's question. Um, I've just been reading in the last couple of weeks, there have been some huge demonstrations in uh, New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, people taking to the streets. Yeah. So outside of your union contacts, yeah. because of the, the flight attendants, yeah. what is the nature of the trans-Pacific organizing going on? Are, are there similar coalitions? Are people in touch with each other? Yeah. This is a constant problem with yeah. these international issues. Mm -hmm. Activists here in the US aren't always actively mm -hmm. uh, coordinating and organizing with very similar organizations and broad coalitions in, in the other countries. Right. I think what we've seen is we've seen a, a paradigm shift when it comes to folks working together. So traditionally, you know, we, we all in our respective fields kind of had our little blinders on. We went about our business. Uh, I'm a labor guy. I represent union members, right? Didn't traditionally get involved with the Sierra Club mm -hmm. or Women's International League for Peace and Freedom as an example, wouldn't normally talk to them, right? Unless we had a piece of legislation or something to, to, to work with them on. What we've seen essentially is this codifying of a, of a truly international uh, coalition. Um, certainly uh, the coalition that I helped lead in Sacramento was a good example of that, um, where we had these very disparate groups, although like-minded on a lot of issues, um, kind of different groups of people come together and that was not necessarily by our prompting. We, we kind of had a moral compass, if you will, that said, you know what, we, this is bigger than just our organization. This is bigger than just CWA. It's bigger than the Sierra Club. And guess what? If we don't work together, we're not going to stop this thing. Yeah. And so we kind of formed over the past couple of years, and really it's been going on for a while, but certainly in earnest the last couple of years, um, and formed this broad-based coalition. Now, I think it's safe to say it's very strong in the U.S., it's very strong in these other countries, but talking together and yeah. working together has been a little bit difficult. There's no, yeah, it's, it's hard because it, of distance, right, time, right. And all this stuff. But. Right. I think we can, we can certainly improve that aspect. Um, we're very good about the street heat, right, and bringing uh -huh. things out to, to visible, uh, the visible forefront as we should. Uh, the, big, the big deal with, with the talks in Maui recently uh, that dissolved thank goodness was you know a big group of activists set a they actually set a guinness uh, world record by coming out on the beach and uh, blowing the those uh, conch, conch shells yeah right I, um great idea right very hawaiian that right? was almost our set picture <laughs> for, for the <laughs> right. show was the conch shells on the mountain right beach. and so these creative opportunities these are just average people coming together how do we get media's attention how do we work together we, we can hold these types of activities on a high intellectual level, on a legislative level, and on the street. 
uh, and really try to blend those together to get the message out to folks and communicate with folks. I think we're going to continue that engagement. As you pointed out earlier, the TPP is not over. Just because Fast Track passed in June, the TPP trade talks are still going on behind the scenes. They don't have any formal talks scheduled at least until November, but they're still uh, each country interacting with one another uh, to try to lead up to, to finalize these talks. Yeah, this week the U.S. and Japan, for example, are working on the, the automotive part of it to, right. to try to work that out before the next formal uh, agreement. Right. Okay, there were some more hands in the audience, and uh, we'll, we'll get to everybody. Um, <clears throat> so, like you were saying, the, the TPP is NAFTA on steroids, mm -hmm. you know? And I was thinking, like, you know, the, the world I can really relate to is the community garden where I have a plot, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like when somebody on the other side of the area grows this huge tomato or whatever, mm -hmm. I just accuse them of having a tomato on steroids, you know? <laughs> the probable fact of the matter is they just used, like, chemical fertilizers and too much water, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, right. but um, you know, it's like, like I feel like I don't like support these multinational corporations, but but I want to support grassroots activists in New Zealand or whatever, you know? So like I'll plant in my plot, I'll plant like bright lights charred, you know? Just so I can tell people the power company has nothing to do with the bright lights in my plot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and And it's like, um, how do you build the win-win from like telling the truth about your own gardening, like all the greens I eat at home, I grew myself. Mm -hmm. How do you build that into like a national shared perspective that can create a different situation moving forward? Good question. I think I think um, you, you pointed out a good point, right? That is, this is this is truly. Uh, a corporate sponsored agreement. It's truly something that totally excludes all of the local, all of the organic, all of the grassroots in these types of organization uh, trade agreements. And so what we have then essentially is a total shutout of anything that is buy local, uh, shop local, uh, small business even, right? So you have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that's a, that's a proponent behind the TPP. You don't have the small businesses that are that are saying, "Hey, this is great, wonderful for me," uh, in Palo Alto or Berkeley or San Francisco or Sacramento, um, because they know it's harmful to them, and we all know this. Um, we don't need a trade agreement or a law to come about to tell us that you know we're we're at risk and and our literal literal or, or figurative plots, if you will, are at risk um, because the corporation doesn't want you to grow your own food; they want you to buy their food. They're genetically modified food, yeah. um, and but uh, they're not going to tell you it's right, genetically correct, modified or correct. where they grow it. That's right, because <laughs> you don't need to know. Right? Um, and and so you know, how do we get that grassroots uh, activism out there and that conversation? We continue to do some of the things we talked about here, holding those public demonstrations. I think one of the most important things that we can continue to do, and we've been doing all along is to hold our elected officials accountable. And that means continuing the dialogue and the pressure on all of them. I think it's a good point here in California to mention that only five of California's congressional uh, Democratic delegation, the largest in Congress, only five of those members of Congress caved and supported the fast track uh, trade uh, that, enabled, that will enable a TPP. Um, so when you look at that, you go, that's great because we were able to hold off all of the rest of the delegation through that grassroots activism, that advocacy, literally having literal sit-ins in their offices, uh -huh. having formal meetings with them uh, in their district and back in, in D.C. Um, they see that. They feel that. They talk to their colleagues about that and go, hey, did you ha what happened in your office? Did you, uh, you know, 
they get those phone calls. We generated through this campaign with Fast Track, and as, as an example, the largest number of handwritten letters, the largest number of phone calls, the largest number of office visits over any modern day issue that I can recall. Um, and that, I think, speaks to the grassroots. It's not about a labor union or a Sierra Club or, or these folks. It's about real people that are connecting the dots working and, together. and talking yeah. about it and working together. Yeah, uh, as long as we're on Congress, I'm going to go right back to the audience uh, in a minute. Um, the, the fast track vote doesn't automatically translate into a final TPP vote. Uh, our own representative in, in this district, Anna Eshoo, uh, at a town hall meeting uh, somewhere back in the beginning of the summer, it was a telephone town hall, mm -hmm. but um, TPP came up on that question mm -hmm. and fast track. And she said rather quickly that she does oppose fast track mm -hmm. on a, an ideological kind of basis, a lot of the reasons you were outlining. Right. Um, but she did remind her constituents that she has supported uh, trade agreements mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect this might be, we might have a real um, kind of struggle campaign mm -hmm. with her. Uh, and just the kind of coalition you mentioned, we, we've often had that around here. We had an epic campaign mm -hmm. aimed at Anna Eshoo around, around NAFTA. Ah. Um, some of the creative stuff, we, we built a uh, graveyard of lost jobs in front of the B of A out on El Camino Real, for I example. I love it. All the, That's great. All these uh, head, headstones and stuff. So uh, this is mostly aimed for people who are in this district, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to put this program on, because I think it's coming, if not later this year, maybe early next year, maybe after the presidential elections. But um, I think this TPP is going to be coming to Congress. Um, and we, we're going to have to really make our voices heard to Anna Eshoo and some of the others because mm -hmm. she's, she's pretty good with her constituents, but we got to remember here in Silicon Valley, she has a very powerful other constituency who yeah. like these uh, trade agreements. That's, that's a great point. In fact, um, a lot of our congressional uh, folks up in Sacramento as well have supported past trade deals, right? Um, let's, let's, let's be real. Let's look back at, at history. And so being cognizant of that, we have to think just because fast track passed doesn't mean that now the TPP is, you know, we're going to be able to kill this or that it's just going to sail, sail by, right? So we've got to not stop that momentum. We've got to keep up the momentum that our coalition built with the fast track fight. Um, it, as you mentioned, it could come up at the end of this year potentially. Um, looks like that might not happen, but we don't know for sure. Yeah. And so we, we, it's not dead until it, it's dead, right? Right. Um, and I think to that end, we need Until to make some sure. Fat ladies right. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make sure that they keep hearing from us. So we don't want this this lull to continue. Right after June, fast track pass. You know, we a lot of us were very disappointed, obviously. But we don't just go in a hole and 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 and, uh, and hide. Right. Right. We continue that advocacy, continue that momentum, continue the accountability on our elected officials, uh, and continue reaching out. So so my ask to you, to everybody that's listening is to call your member of Congress to show up to their district office. Yeah. If you're in D.C., show up to their office in D.C. You can make an appointment with your member and, of and Congress and their staff. And don't give them uh, six months lead time. We have one That's more right. audience question here. Let me get back to her before we run out of time. And if you'd stand up. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that the logic of the agreement is that um, it would do away with all antitrust law. Is that true? Uh, uh, so yeah, that is that's potential to happen under these trade agreements. Again, some of the concern we have is we just can't see everything that's in the trade deal, uh, based on some of pa past trade deals and some of the leaked information. That that is an area of concern. And how much time do you have from when the um, the deal is done, right, and it, and it's open to the public mm -hmm. to see and Congress votes? Is there a set time that's yeah. already been decided? Yeah, so, so under the fast track or trade promotion authority process, if the trade agreement was to be wrapped up and the trade uh, advisor, uh, trade rep, then went back to the president and they sent that to Congress, that would effectually start a, a process um, where for about 60 days they would post the trade agreement online uh, for all of us to see and read, including our elected officials. To be clear, that would be the first time we all would be able to see this trade agreement unredacted, open, 
and actually get to read it. But that's not the, the big point. The big point is we, we see it, we, 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 we get concerned about it, we, we uh, get mad about it, and then we want to do something about it, but guess what? We can't change it. It can't be amended. And in fact, the people that are going to vote on this are members of Congress can't change it and can't amend it. So they can have a little bit of debate in Congress, and that's afforded under the process. But essentially, in about 90 days from start to finish, but with the potential of another 30 days added on at the end, so in about 120 days from start to finish, this would all be uh, over with. Um, and so it's a very little window of opportunity. Again, we can't do anything with it once we see it, which is why we need to stop it from being introduced. When uh, NAFTA was uh, the big trade agreement, um, one of the things that was said was, um, you know, it doesn't have labor rights enforcement, it doesn't have environmental protections in it. And the claim has been made that since then, the, they got the message <laughs> and, and they're including these uh, in just a, a minute or a minute and a half. Can you respond to that? How strong are the, you mentioned labor conditions in uh, Malaysia and, right. and Vietnam in particular. Uh, those are false promises by the administration. Look, I, I uh, supported this president and um, I think that you know, he's done a lot and the administration has done a lot especially for, for workers and for, for labor unions uh, with the National Labor Relations, Relations Board just recently issuing a, a slew of, of pro-worker decisions. That's all great. But when it comes to the TPP and these type of trade deals, they have been closed-lipped on purpose. They're not sharing the specific supposed improvements, improvements that they've made uh, to labor rights provisions. And so how can we really be sure that all of these things that they promise us are actually included? We, we can't. I'd like to believe the administration, I'd like to believe the president, but we don't know for sure. Yeah. We've been talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Robert Longer, Legislative Political Director for Communication Workers of America, Local 9421. Thanks very much for uh, joining us Thank and you. Uh, bringing a lot of wonderful yeah. knowledge. Appreciate and, uh, it. Once we see, once you have the 60 days to read it, maybe I'll have you come back. <laughs> All right. So thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us. And we'll be back next month on October 6th. And in December, there's going to be a major conference on climate change at the United Nations. Speaking of grassroots action, a lot of organizing is going on in front of that. That's what we're going to talk about next month. Thanks for joining us.